this is how we train our contractors. So some of you aren't going to do your own gardening, so we get gardeners, we're going to have landscaping done. This is the spec sheet we give to anyone that's going to plant on our behalf. So we don't actually plant, we subcontract all that out. We just line it up for you. This is the sheet, this is how we want it done, this is the detail that we want. Detail, retail is detail, it's all about exactness. So this is how to put the emitters, how, what, what soil level, we'll go over into detail some of that today before we're done. I thought if you're supervising some, another person um, installing plants for you, hand them this or, or verify this or, or get this way. So you know how it's two emitters on every plant, it's one, gal one gallon per hour for ones to sevens, after that we go to two gallon per hour, what the soil level is, how to amend it. I've actually got a planting guide that I'll email you, that's here. So I've got I had too much I wanted to give you. This is a shotgun. This is uh, this is going to be fast and furious uh, today. You're going to have so many. Your head, your brain, just going to be smoking by the time we're all done. But you'll be better gardeners. Uh, but there were so many handouts I couldn't print them all. The planting guide. If you've been here very long at all, you get one of those every time you buy, buy a tree or shrub. So it's got the warranty. It's got plant, how to plant. It's got how to water. Everything's on there. One sheet. We hand out thousands of them. So I thought, I'm not going to bring that because over half the crowd is going to have that anyway. Uh, but I have, I'll, I'll get that to you if you don't have it, you have a digital copy. And I put together a top um, plant list for our staff. I hire a lot of different new folks, master gardeners, but they're from Connecticut or they're from California or wherever they're from. Well, we, it's a little different here. Well, here are the top 10 vines for the area. Here's the top 10 fall color. Here's the top 10 shrubs under four feet, ground covers. And I broke down the list. There's quite a few plants on it, but it'll help you guide in the right direction. So if you're starting some new, I want, a, I want a erosion control. I go, here's the top 10. By no means all the choices, but here's the top sellers. That, I think that would be valuable for this class and this group. So I'll make sure you get a copy of that. If you give me your email address, you'll get both of those probably by the end of the day or at least by Monday, okay? So you'll have three handouts all together when we're all done. Today I want to cover, I just went, where am I going to start? What, how can I impart some knowledge to you today that'll make a season difference? I mean, right now, it'll make a difference right now in your gardening today. I mean, whether you're, no matter your experience level, what are some things I do in my own gardens that really makes a difference, that really plays out quickly. Um, and so it'll be some of the obscure stuff that really makes a difference. If you're new to the area, how many people, folks, this is your first season growing here? Oh, half the group, super, this, this will be really good. Never underestimate the sun at this altitude. It'll vaporize plants. You've grown geraniums in the Midwest, here, they'll bloom better. They'll, they'll grow in the full sun. The tag says full sun, they won't grow there. But they just won't bloom as long. They do better with part shade, little protection. You'll find their buds stay on there much, much longer. So you see idiosyncrasies like that, you'll have to change a little bit. Um, if you're from the Northwest, you're from Japanese maple country, the Northeast, basically north of here, which is everyone. Um, you're, you're basically the Japanese maples. Well, if you read the tag, you do your Google research, it says, oh, it grows everywhere, that'll be great, full sun, let it grow at the top of the ridge lines, let the wind at it. It's not gonna like it here in that kind of environment. It's gonna like shade, full shade, to, to a little bit of sun, not too much. Or it'll get burned tips, it will live, it'll, it'll do what the tag says. It'll just be the world's ugliest plant for you. Well, that's not why you buy a Japanese maple. I mean, they're sexy. They just, they're voluptuous. They're beautiful. They're wavy. They're soft. And they're wimpy. And so they don't like to be exposed to our altitude and our sun. So you've got to kind of put them in just the right place. What you'll find here is, in the mountains of Arizona, the, uh, you've got to be more of a gardener. You've got to be more exacting. In the southeast, we're sort of humid and moist. I mean, you could check, I could throw this hat on the ground. It would start to grow. You don't have to be a gardener to garden in the southeast. You just got to slop around and it just kind of goes. Here, you've got to be more garden-esque. You don't have to be exact. And my goal is to get you where you can make a few mistakes and recover 
and kind of guide from there. And gardening is learned by, by mistakes, isn't it? It's kind of how we kind of make it all go. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to go over, what, are we, what am I going over? How to get to, how to deal, how to plant, how to get the foliage to stay, stay moist for you. Uh, I've got, I'll touch on some bugs, some things that are showing up right now. And then uh, repellents, because we are in the middle of the forest. Basically, Arizona is national forest, and we are surrounded by mule deers, javelina. We didn't have those until you moved here. Uh, so some of those, kind of how to deal with some of that. And then I put together a few plant collections, things that go together that you can plant and they have certain styles. I thought I'd go over certain plant styles. You, you'll have a certain style that you can come to, come to mind with. So I thought I'd go over there. That's kind of the format today. Sound good? Okay. So let's go over how to plant. Um, basically, here's soil level. Here's the curse of the desert. The desert says, dig a hole and make sure your plant is down here in this divot. So we've got our plant coming out here. So we're below grade by three, four inches. Don't ever do that here. That is a curse. It'll kill your plants and it'll die during the monsoon season. So you want your plants to be at soil level. So here's soil. You want it to be at soil level. Yeah, now you need a new, new sheet. You want it to be at soil level or even a little above. You folks out 69 corridor, the ranch, you have up by hills, Prescott Valley, all the way to Cordes Junction. That's where the caliche layers are. Um, that is super hard soil. Caliche is basically, the old Indian term is concrete in the ground. Not really, I just made that up. But anyway, 80% of all facts or all, all quotes are made up on the fly. Um, I think someone quoted that, at least I did. Um, really hard soil, the soil is so hard it doesn't perk. So the soil doesn't actually breathe. The plants give off oxygen at the foliage level, but they have to have oxygen at the root level. If they don't, you fill all those air pockets up with water molecules, all of a sudden the plant will have root rot, the thing will die on you. I mean, just guaranteed, and it will happen during the monsoon season. I'll tell you why in just a moment. So here, you want your planting hole. Let's say you've got a five-gallon bucket. That's a standard size right here. Okay. It's a five-gallon bucket. You only want to be as deep as the root ball, no deeper. It's easy to dig a shallow, wide hole than it is a deep hole. But you want to put a hole on, you want to be as wide, three times wider than this bucket. Okay, so it makes sense. So three, three times the width, same depth, saucer shape. So, it's going to be like this. And that picture's on that handout for you. That was, this is for landscapers, obviously landscapers. I'm a landscaper. They don't read, they don't read so good. They need pictures. So, that, put it right there, plain and simple. Show it to them. Um, any landscapers in the room, I didn't mean to fit you, but I want to, so I figured I'd fit myself. Uh, this is the root ball. There's the tree. So you got all this dirt that you've pulled out of the ground here. You want to filter this soil. Some of you won't have any dirt left. It's all <laughs> rock, all clay, all chunks. But you do want to filter that. Some of you have some of the old, uh, older properties. There's some old farmland and stuff. There's some nice soil. But a lot of you, all you, this looks like the uh, Jet Set Cruise Cruisers. You guys have all those mansions up on the hilltops. You've got no soil. It's all rocky, chunky, exposed, everything. But the vistas are beautiful. Here you're going to want to filter that soil out. Anything bigger than a golf ball, get rid of it. Uh, rocks, roots, just debris. You'll find old construction debris in there. I've, I've pulled out bricks out of my soil. They just buried it. Uh, so filter that out. What's left, you want to amend with some organic matter, compost. We call it premium mulch. That's our water's mulch is our compost. You want to use about 25% mulch to your native earth, okay? If you had a big rock, some of you, it's like the iceberg, you looked little when you got into it, but when you started to dig it out, it turned into this huge boulder. You don't have so much dirt left. You can maybe get up to about 50% compost to your uh, native earth and blend that together. Make sure you blend it. Don't put it in layers. Roots do not like to go through different kinds of soils. They like consistency. 
So you want to blend that up, and then that's the, that's the mixture we're going to use to backfill around this root ball. Okay? Make sense? Doing okay? Okay. So we're going to backfill this. You want this to be at soil level or even a little above. You folks out that 69 corridor where it's really heavy, or if you're worried about the perk, you, you're just not sure if it drains enough. There you might even want to leave a little of the root ball out of the ground. Let me just explain what that is. So here, I would leave about this much of the root out of the ground if it's really hard, and then I'll mound that soil up so in the landscape, you won't really see it, but at the root level, it'll make sure that some of that rain that comes in the summer will filter away from that root ball. So you're, the, the plant is going to drown in the summer if it's going to drown. So, and it's all about getting the water away from the roots. It seems counterintuitive, but in really heavy clay soils, your soil just does not perk. The water sits there. So we tend to overwater. In fact, I would say if you're going to make a mistake, it'll be from overwatering, not underwatering. This, because the soils are so, so heavy. If you get closer to Granite Mountain, there the soils become more granity, more sandy, and the water just goes whoosh right through. There you've got really crazy good drainage, almost too good. So you need to mend it really heavily there with organics to hold the moisture at the root level. So either way, you're either trying to cut the soil so it, so it aerates, it set, keeps the soil from compacting back down, or you want to add organics in there to keep the moisture around it. Okay? So that's how you backfill. Stamp on it until it's just like the bigger the man, the better. Really pound on it. Don't let any air pockets be left around that root ball. And then uh, water it in. That's how you plant. Now, I always use three things whenever I plant. I use mulch. I use uh, a fertilizer. I put this all-purpose plant food on. It's a nice organic, slow release. It's a great one for new plantings. So for a one gallon plant, you're using about one tablespoon. This will be in the handout coming, coming your way. Uh, it'll tell you exactly how much of all of this stuff. Exactly how much mulch, exactly food, all, all this stuff. But one tablespoon for a one gallon plant, two tablespoons for a two gallon plant, for a five gallon plant, guess how many tablespoons? Uh, five, yeah, 15 for 15. So it's like, it's like a handful for a five gallon, and I sprinkle that right on top around there. I don't work it in. Some folks, you gardeners, that bothers you. You like to work everything in the soil. I'm a chuck and go guy. I like to get in and out. I'm going, I'm going, I mean, I was on Watson Lake on a paddleboard yesterday morning at seven. It was a little cold, but I'd rather do that than go work in the soil. Uh, but you can just, Put it right on the ground and it will water and go through the soil layers. If you really want to, you can blend it in. You can, I bet you can blend it in when you're putting your mulch in. I don't think it matters a bit. Just get it on there. You do not have any food in your soil that naturally occurs. There's nothing. You've got dead, a lot of you have dead soil, literally dead soil. Your contractor came in with that backhoe and scraped off that little bit of topsoil that was there, scraped it right off and chucked it off to the side and started putting your, your footers in. So some of you literally, all the mycorrhizal, all the, fun, all the fungi, all the worms, all the beneficials you had in the soil was put off to the side. And what you're left with is dead soil. An indi indication is, and you'll see this play out in your, in, your, in your gardens. I've seen it over and over in my own. You plant, and three years later, the plant is still sitting there, not dying, not growing, just sitting there. That's a plant that's going, I'm not happy here, I'm not growing here, this, this soil is dead, I'm not, I'm not growing into this, there's nothing to go after, so I'm just going to stay alive right here. I'm just not going to, you need to reintroduce organics back into your soil. So that, that's why we're using so much mulch or organics. If you're composters, you're going to have really great soils here. If you're not, you'll need to add some every time you plant an individual uh, plant. Or we just go raise beds. And we just abandon the whole ground thing. We just don't want to use our soil, which is what I kind of did in my own yards. I'm on this classic slope, dug out basement, two story, bottom story is at the basement level, the top story is walk in, classic. Um, my soil is so heavy and so hard and so bad I just said, I'm going to put block on the bottom end, bottom of part of the hill, 
I'm just going to backfill. So I've just got these tiers of raised beds all the way down the entire property, pretty much. I just went with, I just abandoned my natural soil. Okay, fertilizer, and then I water it in with root and grow. This is rooting hormone. Uh, root, uh, B1, remember your grandparents used B1? Um, what we found is B1 doesn't work. <laughs> we did university testing, and uh, we found that B1 and water, there was no difference whatsoever in the root mass. As soon as we put a, a very mild fertilizer with a little bit of rooting hormone, all of a sudden we had more root mass. So we're studying this stuff. And so this is one that we put together ourselves. Here, it's, it really does work. This is a liquid, so it's concentrated. You'll about three tablespoons in a gallon of water. I usually have my two gallon watering can sitting there waiting with this already mixed up. As soon as that plant's in, I start watering, and watering that thing in. I don't care whether it's a tomato, a, a shrub, a tree, whatever. Whatever it is, I water it in with this. And I use this every two weeks until I see the plant stabilized. This is for transplant shock and encourage new root hairs. And so as soon as I see new buds, new leaves forming, then I go, okay, that's enough of this. I don't want to waste any more time, energy, money. I move on. So it's, it's stabilized. Then the food starts kicking in, all that organic that you added starts kicking in. The handout that I'm going to give you, I do personally. Now this is not in my normal planting. This is what this gardener does. Um, I actually sprinkle some of this in everything I plant. This is called uh, Aqua Boost Crystals. It's something I, I came up with and made. Um, I've been playing with these things for like 20 years now. Polymer crystals. Sometimes you'll see them at the fair. They'll make those uh, neckerchiefs that you, you, you soak in water and they swell up and they hold water so they kind of evaporate and cool you off. That's what this stuff is, okay? It's actually an old ag product because we've been using it for many years. I used to put it in all of our hanging baskets because it would take the pressure off because hanging baskets dry out so quickly. But then everyone kept returning the hanging baskets going, this has snail eggs in it. Because they were mis they didn't know what it was. Now, okay, I can't, I'm not gonna fight this one. We just, we'll just add more anyway. We changed the, the bucket that we used. But I add some of this in, at the bottom of each hole. The reason I do that is it swells up and holds the moisture in at the root level. So it doesn't allow it to dry out. And then as the crystals swell and shrink with water, it keeps the soil open, so it, it makes it keeps it porous. And then we've infused the uh, crystals <coughs> with mycorrhizal fungi. That's that's the beneficials. There's naturally occurring fungus in your soil. The plants go, oh, this is so great. This is the best thing. It's a symbiotic thing that happens. But what happens is your contractor scraped all that topsoil off, and now you don't have any colonies left. You literally have dead soil. So we're trying to recharge on the front end, we're trying to front load the soils with new colonies. And so this is a great way. So you got a product that encourages new roots and then holds moisture. So it really takes the pressure off of my, my watering, my drip system, especially containers and raised beds. Really great stuff. I buy one this size. Uh, this is the biggest size that we make. This is probably a season's worth. This makes like gallons and gallons of, uh, this swells up to hold a lot of, a lot of water. Uh, but I just have this size always on there. I sprinkle a little bit on it every time I plant. It, okay? Called Aqua Boost Crystals. That's kind of an extra step I take. Yeah. Does it work on houseplants too? It would work on houseplants, especially if you travel a lot. Now, houseplants, it's hard to get it in there. So usually you'll take a pencil or a screwdriver or something, poke it in the soil, and then try to sprinkle it in uh, on established plants in there. And it will actually double the length of time you can go in between each water cycle. So it'll. it'll so now you're watering instead of every week, you're watering every two weeks, every 10 days. You see the value of that if you're traveling a lot, you've got a house plant, they just have to keep laying over dead. Or we always have house sitters. Guaranteed when you get back, something's going to be dead. So it just kind of goes with how it's part of the expense of the travel. That we do. Okay, and that's, that's really, that's everything. I'll get, get your hand out with that on it, but uh, you, you'll have all the details with schematics on how to, how to plant with that. I think it's also got the water guide. Yeah. Can you add the uh, crystals after you've already planted? Now the crystals, the way I, okay, so do we add the crystals afterwards? I always put it down before. Actually, when I've yeah. dug my hole, 
I sprinkle some at the bottom of the hole is what I do. I can kind of scrape it in. Um, I've also added it when I blended my mulch in. Uh, I don't know that I've seen a, that big a difference. I just want some. I was really after the mycorrhizal colonies. I'm trying to charge that. And then the polymers are almost a bonus in my world. Uh, for my container gardens, I do a lot of container gardens. It's almost a must because containers are more exposed and they dry out faster. There, I do blend the Aqua Boost into the top layer of the potting soil where my plants are going to be spending most of their, their energy getting roots. So that's kind of what this gardener does. There's several, you'll read all kinds of stuff on the internet with that. This kind of local knowledge, how I've played with it. One last question, we'll move on. So for stuff that's already been planted in containers, just do the screwdriver thing. Yeah. Try to get it down a little bit. So her question was, for things that are already established, the, the aqua boost, how do I get it into the soil? And there a piece of rebar hammered in or a big screwdriver. Just get, get some holes around the edge okay. and sprinkle it in. You don't want it right at the trunk, you want it at the drip lines. Go okay. out towards the outer edge. Let's say a big red tip potinia or spruce or okay. some of these bigger plants. Okay, let's move on to let me think here. Let's go over keeping plants healthy. Um, some of you are going to love your, your hydrangeas, go to dinner room, especially East Coast folks. I love those too. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a Japanese maple waiting to go in a big, huge pot in my house right now. So I'll probably plant it tomorrow or the next, next couple days. It's a big red lace leaf uh, Japanese maple. It is a spectacle. I mean, it's beautiful. It's also going to dry out if I expose it to any amount of wind. Well, I'm up at Eagle Ridge, up on a ridge line. What's the likelihood of keeping that thing out of the wind? Zero percent chance. So I gotta protect it. What I do with that, I've already sprayed it because it's gonna go into, into shock when I take it out of the bucket that it's known. I put it in this new container, it's gonna go into shock. So I went through a couple days ago and I sprayed it with cloud cover. Now, stuff you will never hear mentioned any place except for my friends, you all, today. This is what this gardener does. It makes a huge difference. Uh, how many of you have chapstick in your pocket or purse right now? Yeah, like most of us? This is chapstick for plants, literally. You just put it on your lips. It keeps your lips from drying and cracking. Well, the leaves, they dry and crack as well. This cloud covers like a clear, it's a clear coating that you, that it, that it locks in the moisture in the foliage. And so you'll get some plants, especially if you're new, you're, the Midwestern folks have a, have a hard time dealing with how bright the sun is in the West. It is intense. Uh, it does dry out plants faster than you're used to. It used to grow out full sun in Kansas, but now, it, now I'm having trouble. Well, Toto, we're not in Kansas anymore. So this is, uh, this, this is a clear spray that you put on there. I put it on all my flowers last weekend, Easter, Easter weekend. I planted a lot of flowers in my, in my container, just kind of spruced things up. And then we had the frost, what was that? Uh, two, Wednesday or so, somewhere in there, it was midweek. Um, I sprayed this on everything because I knew the frost was coming. This will get you a couple extra degrees before you get frost damage. When I got down to 30 degrees, I had no damage. Uh, so this this will help you with keep it from drying out. It also helps you from so if you're getting stressed out Plants look dry and crusty. Don't water it more Literally what happens is the roots are taking up moisture as fast as it can But the leaves are perspiring faster than the roots can keep up And so you get these brown tips on the leaves that it, it's unique to the mountains of Arizona So it's dry. It's windy. I think I'm reading like 10% humidity on my on my rain gauges and stuff, I think it's only because it doesn't go down to single digits. I think it goes drier than ten percent. When it's raining out, I only register like eighty-five percent humidity. It's raining. How can it not be a hundred percent humidity? But it is. It's just the way it reads. This is drier than normal. This helps lock that in. So if you have stress, this will really help help you. Okay. You're, you're trying to cheat. Okay, so he's saying if I plant my tomatoes early and I spray it with this, will it keep the frost off? Now, tomatoes are a tropical plant. 
they're like your house plants. So they do not like to be below 50 degrees, much less 30, 30s. And so I don't think I would plant, if you're gonna plant tomatoes early, it, this would be good for them. I've sprayed my tomatoes with this, but I would actually get a plant protector. They actually make a little teepee, a little uh, protection, a little housing for tomatoes that warms the soil up, warms your, keeps, keeps the snow and frost off of your tomatoes. We can go over that afterwards and show you what that is. But no, I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't try to go too early. This is mainly for things that are naturally gonna grow out there, but maybe their foliage is coming out a bit tender. You wanna protect them. Um, this is what that, that's what you'll use that for, okay? Um, if you just don't know how to water, this is a great tool. You probably ought to own one of these. It's just a water meter. Until you get familiar with, with the frequency of how, how often to water, they make tools that are really great that help you get a feel for, because what will happen is the soil will look dry, but down below, it's actually still moist. It takes a long time for that much soil, your root mass, the whole root mass to dry out. Just because the top looks dry doesn't mean you need to rehydrate or put the irrigation back on. So this will help you gauge, especially for raised beds, um, containers, that kind of stuff. Things that are maybe a little more exposed to wind and sun, this will really help you. I think you ought to have one. The only thing I can tell you is this tip, that's where the moisture meter is. If you're going into native soil, I've broken a few of these over the years. If you hit a rock, it goes dink, breaks right off. So kind of be careful when you're doing it, okay? Uh, animals, let's go over that. Again, this is there's a lot of technical with this, but some of you are right there in that interface where Havelina are coming right through. I was just helping a friend looking at his gardens. He was having problems with his grasses up on the driveway. Because the animals keep digging it up, I can't remember his issues. I look over, he's got this classic driveway, it's down here. You look down and there's like a herd of javelina sitting underneath the scrub oak, camping out on his property. I'm going, that's your, that's your problem, get rid of those guys. Uh, he's going to have to physically put a barrier up because they just live. This is, this is their space, he built his house there. So there we need to actually change their habits to go to your house, <laughs> or your house, or your house, somewhere else other than my house. Go somewhere else, and they will. You just got to train them. If you, sometimes you'll just have the roamers, like a deer. They like, they love new things. They notice when you put that new, whatever it is. They take notice. I mean, this is my domain. Oh, oh, look, something new, Joe. Let's go over and check this out. And so they'll come nibble on stuff just because it's new. They don't, and they've got a digestive system where they've eaten half the plant before they realize they don't even like it. <laughs> so they, they'll actually try it for a while until, and then they'll go, yeah, it doesn't taste, uh, it isn't what, what I thought it was. And then they move on. They kind of graze through the neighborhood. If you've got that kind of stuff, if you've got pressure, repels all. This is a great repellent. Don't tempt them. If you're in it, if you've got some pressure that naturally occurs, when it goes in the ground, have some of this out there and just spray it right away. That way you can train those animals to go, oh, every time I smell this, every time I see something new, it smells like this. Oh, and I never like it. I shouldn't even try it. And then they just, you gotta train them to keep moving to the neighbors. Go to the neighbors, <laughs> to the neighbors. But just be up front with it. Don't be reactionary. A lot of times, mule deer are like white tails are only with 50 more pounds. So they just, they're bigger, they're more aggressive. Um, this, that technique also worked in the elk. I lived in Skull Valley for a lot of years. My kids were raised in Skull Valley. Herds of elk were roaming in the ranch country. And so it kept them off. They just got used to, every time I smell this, it just tastes bad. Eh, okay, move on. So be up front loaded. Don't, don't be reactionary on it, okay? And then the snakes just came out. We are in snake country. I know some of you freak out. Some of you are really weird. You actually like snakes. <laughs> Most of us don't. Uh, snakes are very uh, migratory. So they camp out all together. They're like in these huge pits or under the rocks. They own like hundreds of snakes. And then they come out in the spring. They just came out. They're starting to migrate. They'll move several miles to their new, to, where they're, to their territory. Um, they actually make snake repellents, things you can put around the barrier, the uh, edges of your property, of the garden, and uh, they won't cross this. So you put it as a line around the fence lines, around the, the gardens, they'll hit that, they'll smell those, that, that, those herbs, they'll just literally turn and go the other way. So if you're afraid of rattlesnakes, are the main one that we have here. 
Uh, there's several different types of rattlesnakes. It'll keep the snakes from coming in. Okay. Gopher, gopher snake or bull snakes, they look like rattlesnakes, except their heads are real narrow. You know, vipers have that great big uh, triangular shaped head. Those are the dangerous ones. They get the poison glands back in the... Anyway, we'll go into anatomy later. But uh, gopher snakes are generally good. They keep the pack rats and the gophers and things, things at bay. Okay. Those are two quick things that just kind of, maybe it's kind of cursory moving on, but that's kind of how you quickly repel things right off the bat. But I think those are the top line things you ought to really new, know if you're new to the area. Um, gophers, I just, this is my own personal gopher probe. I was using it this morning when I should bring this in and show it off. Gophers can be bad here. That's an underground rat, basically. <laughs> And rats should die. You folks in the South, you know what I'm talking about, right? Rats <laughs> need to die. I'm from Virginia. All my family's from Georgia. Deep, deep, deep. Some of them still have some of their teeth. <laughs> Not any of them, but some of them. Um, anyway, rats are bad. Now, I had a new gopher that came up by the underneath my akebia, a vine, and it's just a little mound there. I've been fighting them for two months. They keep wanting to come in, and I am deadly, Miss. My ground's just got to smell like death and decay, but they're still coming. So I was out there doing this. What this is, bait. You, you put the bait inside this hopper, and then uh, you'll see a mound with a gopher, gopher, pocket gopher. There's an old mound of dirt there. If you probe just around the outside edge with this, with this uh, probe, you'll feel it slip all of a sudden. It'll be inside the tunnel. It's, the toe would just actually slip. And so it allows me to release the bait. So here you've got, I don't want too much of that going out. But anyway, I don't want any of it to go out because it's poison. But anyway, it allows you to get the poison. It's got a little opening trap door here. It allows you to get the poison inside the run, underneath the ground, back where they're actually active. And so I just have this. I just always have it going around. I just have it out. It took me like two minutes to go out and kill this gopher, or he will be dead very shortly, by the end of the day. He'll eat some of the corn, basically, get kind of sick to his stomach, go to bed, and never wake up. <laughs> <laughs>